Okay, uh, we're going to continue on this topic. We'll try to finish it off today. Uh, so we have uh, some more applications of the derivative. Uh, applications of the derivative will get, uh, you know, this is all stuff you can manage. Uh, anybody, ra raise your hand if you're able to kind of finish your homework problems from the past couple days. Anybody? Okay. What's that? So just, just that one through six. Okay. Three. Okay. Well, we can talk about that, but um, you're definitely going to have... You're definitely going to have a question like that on your test, so we'll continue to work through it. That's definitely stuff that you guys can master. Now, with that said, I want you to know that we're talking about first derivatives right now. We are going to get to a point where we talk about second and third and their application as well. I told you about velocity. Second derivative is acceleration. We do talk about those things as time goes on, and we'll get to it. However, for right now, um, we're going to go over still some very manageable problems. But this is another example. That is a, it's a classic type of problem that you've actually seen in Algebra 1. You've seen in Algebra 2. You've seen in pre-calculus. Now we're going to look at a calculus and solve it from a calculus perspective, which is uh, rather neat. So a ball is thrown upward with an initial velocity of 18 meters per second. The height of the ball is modeled by the equation h of t equals 18t minus 4.9t squared. Does that look familiar to you guys? You've seen something like that before? Yeah. And so, okay, physics. Well, what's nice is that we have our position function. I'm just going to write it down so we're just all clear on what we're doing here. But well, we could say position. And the position is h of t is equal to 18t minus 4.9t squared. But... Velocity is an entirely different scenario. The velocity in terms of t, 18 minus 9.8t. So, Larry, how did you get that? That's the derivative. Okay, that is the derivative. And for those of you that are in physics, you, you maybe know that the acceleration of gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second. So if we took the derivative of this again, that would be negative 9.8. So the acceleration. So there's no mistake about that. That's exactly what we're doing. So it says, what is the maximum height that the ball reached? Maximum height. That the, what shape does this make if we were to graph it? The parabola. So the maximum height is also the top. What do we call the top of the parabola? The vertex. So we're really finding the vertex. Well, you guys maybe remember we do negative b over 2a or stuff like that. Well, there's another way in calculus to do uh, the, the maximum, and that's by taking the derivative and setting it equal to 0. Why? Is the velocity positive on the way up or on the way down? On the way up. And it's negative on the way down. So if the velocity transfers from positive to negative, it has to cross over zero. And so at the top, the velocity is zero. So we're going to do a couple things here which are kind of interesting. First of all, the maximum height, I take the velocity and I set it equal to zero. What, what am I solving for here? What, what will my result be labeled? This result is going to be labeled seconds, isn't it? Okay. Time. So this will give me the time, but the question is the maximum height. So let's solve this first. I have 18 minus 9.8t. So what I have here then is, a, as I solve this, I have 9.8t is equal to 18. Somebody divide that. What do you get? 1.83, and we have seconds. That's a time of 1.83 seconds. Have I answered the question? No. So I need to plug this back in. Do I plug it back into the velocity function or into the height function? The height, the position function. So h of 1.83 is equal to, if we take 18 times 1.83 minus 4.9 times 1.83 squared. Somebody have that? 16.53, and what's the label? Meters. 
So that's my answer. 16.53 meters is, in fact, the maximum height of the parabola. Now, do you remember, do you remember uh, how you, in terms of A, B, and C, how you locate the vertex of a parabola? So if I have Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C, do you remember the formula that we used to find the vertex of a parabola? Negative B divided by 2A. That's the top or the bottom of the parabola. Negative B divided by 2A. Would you agree that the top or the bottom, a maximum or minimum, that that's the spot where the derivative is zero? If I draw it, it's at that spot where the derivative is zero. Well, look at this. We're going to do a two-second proof. I'm going to prove to you right now that the vertex is negative B divided by 2A. In order to prove it, I set this thing equal to zero and take the derivative. If I take the derivative, I take this 2 and multiply it out front, right? And A is just a constant. And I get 2A times X. Plus, what's the derivative of BX? B. And what's the derivative of C? Zero. Well, the vertex is going to be located at the X value. So I'd like to solve for X. Negative B equals 2AX. Solve for X by dividing by... So we've just proved through calculus that the vertex of a parabola is negative b divided by 2a. And the amount of different proofs you can use uh, from calculus are limitless. And so it's really cool to see that something that you were just always told, you may be wondering, well, why is that true? Well, there you go, calculus. So, All right, let's go to the next problem. It says, what is the height of the ball after two seconds? Height of the ball after two, which one do I plug it into? Position. So I've got h of 2 equals 36 minus 4.9 times 4. Uh, the height should be positive. 36 minus... 19.6, which is 16.4 meters. Let's think about that. Does it make sense that the height after two seconds is less than the height at 1.83? Why? Because it's on its way down. Very good. Next question. What is the velocity of the ball after two seconds? What do I plug that into? The velocity function, V of 2, is equal to 18 minus uh, 9.8 times 2 is going to be 19.6. Negative 1.6. What's the label? Meters per second. You have to label on your test. Know what you're using. If it's a derivative, it's a rate. Does it make sense that the derivative is negative? Because it's going down. Okay. At what time does the ball have a height of 20 meters? Which one? The top or the bottom? The velocity function or the position function? I take the position function. Very good. Well, uh, if we were to solve for, what, well, uh, if we were to solve for it, we would get uh, 16. Point what? Five three. So if we were to solve for it, we get an imaginary solution. I want you to understand what that would mean. So as long as you understand, you get an imaginary solution. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Uh, yeah, we would take the height function, set it equal to 20, and use the quadratic formula. Okay, one more question, okay? What height does the ball... have 
a velocity of one meter per second. The question is at what height does the ball have a velocity of one meter per second? First of all, what's the initial velocity? Yep, it says right here that the initial velocity is 18 meters per second. And at the top, it has a velocity of zero. So will it cross over one meter per second at some point? Sure. The question is, what height does it have a velocity of one? How will I solve that type of problem? Very good. Larry says this, and this is what we're going to do. So let's just start with the basic. Height of the ball, velocity of one meter per second. First, let's figure out what time it's got that velocity. I take my velocity function and set it equal to 1. 1 equals 18 minus 9.8t. I'm trying to solve for height. When I solve for this, does that give me height? No, it simply gives me time. So let's do that first. I can subtract my 18 and get negative 17 equals negative 9.8t. Divide by negative 9.8. Anybody? 1.73 seconds. Now... The, to answer the question, it says, at what height does it have that velocity? So what do I do? I plug this time, 1.73, back into the position function. So h of 1.73 is... Sixteen point four seven. Is that close to the top? Yeah, that makes sense. If it was launched with an initial velocity of eighteen, and it, it it slows all the way down to zero at the top, it would make sense that that one would be pretty close to the top if it was launched an initial of uh, eighteen. So that makes sense. It, does that make easier than yesterday? Yep. It, that's because yeah, without a doubt. Okay. All right. Let's try something else. You guys know Boyle's Law? Okay. Boyle's Law uh, states that when a sample of gas is compressed at a constant temperature, the product of the pressure and the volume remains constant. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, what happens uh, to my tires uh, when winter comes around? Yeah, the, it, it deflates. Okay. Temperature uh, obviously increases, right? Okay. And now think about this, okay? Um, if I've got a balloon and I'm going to blow it up, okay, and I, I haven't started blowing it up at all, okay, what is the, uh, what's the pressure of that balloon? Is it, is it going to be small or big? It's going to be small, okay? All right. And obviously as I increase the pressure, what's going to happen to the volume in that situation? It's increase. But that's allowed to expand, isn't it? So Boyle's Law, does it, it says Boyle's Law states that when a sample of gas is compressed at a constant temperature, the product of the pressure and the volume remains constant. Okay? So this doesn't have to do necessarily with the balloon, does it? The balloon doesn't involve the temperature. This one involves a constant temperature. So that's what we're talking about. So these are inversely related. As the pressure goes up, what happens to the volume? It goes down. As the volume goes up, what happens to the pressure? Goes down. So these are different related, okay? So find the rate of change of volume with respect to pressure. Find the rate of change of volume with respect to pressure. This is a difficult thing to think about, but rate of change of volume, what does that mean? Rate of change is another word for derivative. So what we want to do is we find want to find the derivative of what? Volume. Is that solved for volume? 
No, let's not solve for volume. Can I solve for volume? Yeah, I can rewrite this as volume equals what? C over P. Does C ever change? No, it's a constant. It's like the number four. Does the pressure change? Yes. So I'm going to write this even a little bit differently. Volume equals C times P to the negative one. So let's take that derivative. What is the derivative of V? How would you write that? V prime. Okay, that's how we write that. Yep. Negative CP to the negative 2. How could we rewrite that? That's the derivative. Negative C over P squared. That is the rate of change of the volume. You can see that would be very useful in physics, wouldn't it? And you're able to figure out that rate of change very quickly. So let's answer this next question then. It says, a sample of gas is in a container at a low pressure and is steadily compressed at a constant temperature for 20 minutes. Is the volume decreasing more rapidly at the beginning or at the end of the 20-minute period? What is that asking? It's asking about the rate of change, okay? Is the volume decreasing more rapidly, rate of change? Uh, I really need a balloon in here or something else. Okay. Let's think about this, okay? We're going to... I've got a container right here. It's imaginary. You guys can see it, right? It's just not Lindsay. Okay, very good. All right. I'm going to squish this container. I'm going to put pressure on it, okay? It said it's compressed, okay? We're going to keep temperature constant. If I'm compressing this container, okay, and maybe I could get it about that small, we'll say, okay, as I start compressing it, is it going to go down more quickly at the beginning or at the end? The beginning, yeah, there's more compressing to take place at the beginning. When you get down, it, it's going to go down even slower and slower and slower, right? That's what this question is asking. It just wants you to understand that rate of change. Now, we could plug in some arbitrary values and see that, in fact, the derivative uh, is is you know greater at the beginning. That's decreasing at a greater rate. But that's all they're asking. As you compress something, it's the volume is going to go down more quickly at the beginning, and it's going to slow down at the end. Okay. So is the volume decreasing more rapidly at the beginning or the end of the 20-minute period? The beginning. Do you spell beginning with two ends? Okay, last thing. Class function. Okay, now we're going to go to economics. Okay, so you're going to have a sample problem in each of the type of these in your homework. Class function is C of X. We represent the class function with C of X. Okay, the cost to produce X items, okay? So, let's just uh, use an example here. Um, Larry's got a lemonade stand, okay? Larry is going to, um, 
it costs Larry um, 10 cents, 15 cents we'll say, okay, per glass of lemonade. So his cost function is 0.15x, okay? Now, what do you think companies want to do? Do you think they want to minimize cost or maximize cost? They want to minimize cost. And minimize cost, the, the minimum happens when the derivative is equal to zero, okay? The minimum happens when, when the uh, derivative is equal to zero. Well, the marginal cost function can be expressed like this. C prime of X. And that's the rate at which the cost is changing. So let me let me give you an example. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Larry is not just selling lemonade. He's selling like super lemonade. They're gonna they're gonna buy it at the stores and everything. Okay, all right. So Larry's going into mass production. Okay, now do you think it's more efficient for Larry to set up his huge mass production for lemonade? You think it's more efficient for him to do that and produce ten cans of lemonade, or do you think it's more efficient to produce uh? 10,000 cans of lemonade. 10,000 is more efficient. What's obviously going to cost more? Is it going to cost him more to produce 10, or is it going to cost him more to produce 10,000? 10, 10,000. However, the rate at which his cost is changing is better after 10,000. He's already done 10,000. Why not just do 10,200, right? But to get started, it costs a lot to get started sometimes, doesn't it? So that's what they want to know is when, when is that spot where we're at our kind of our best point? And here's what C prime of X really means in terms of uh, in terms of that that uh, idea. Not just the rate at which the cost is changing, but the cost to produce It's the cost to produce the X plus one or the next item. So for example, let's say Larry's producing cans of lemonade. And let's say he can produce a can of lemonade at the beginning. Let's say at the beginning it costs him a buck for a can of lemonade to produce it. It's like, well, nobody's going to pay a dollar for a can of lemonade. You better produce more. So by the time he's uh, done with 10000 only it only it's only costing him approximately five cents per can. Well, what do you think it's going to cost you to pr actually produce that next can? About five cents, whatever that rate is. So let's look at an example. Company produces X number of shoes. The cost can be estimated by the following function. If they want to produce a million shoes, they got to plug it in there and see what they get. The question is, what is the marginal cost function? What do I do? Take the derivative. What's the derivative of the cost function? Five plus point zero two x. Would you agree? Okay. Now, what is c prime of five hundred? Where do I plug that in? I plug it in the marginal cost function, c prime. So, what is c prime of five hundred? C prime of five hundred is five plus point zero two times five hundred. We got it. Fifteen. Yep. What's the label? Dollars. You tell me which this means. Does this mean that it has it costs them fifteen dollars to produce five hundred items, or does it tell me that it will cost them fifteen hundred or fifteen dollars to produce the next item? The next item. It's at a rate of fifteen dollars. Okay, so it says interpret what C prime of 500 means. It will cost approximately
fifteen dollars to produce the next item. And I say approximately because it's it's not exactly, okay? It's not exact. And I can show you how to figure out exact, and that's our last one, okay? It says compare C prime of 500 with the cost of producing the 500 first item, okay? The cost of producing... The 500 first item is, it's easy to figure out the cost of producing the 500 first item. We take the cost of producing 501 items and we subtract the cost of producing 500 items. Well, if we figure out what the cost is of producing 500, 1, and then subtract it from the cost of producing 500, that should give us the cost of that 500 first item. And it should be pretty close to $15. So what are we going to plug this into, C or C prime? C, so we've got to plug in 500 to 10,000 plus 5x plus 0.01x squared. I'm going to take out my calculator, and I'm going to go to my table. Zebra is up there. Are you opening calculator? You're acting like you're opening. Yeah, it doesn't like that. Okay, did anybody get it? My calculator is not opening. Yeah, what'd you get for difference? 15.01. How does that compare to C prime of 500? It's very, very, very close. Ask. Okay. So, and that, that's totally normal, okay? So this is the cost of producing X number of items. The rate of change of the cost is the derivative or the marginal cost function. And what we say is this. When we find the derivative... That's approximately what it will cost to produce that next item. Approximately. Because the derivative is instantaneous. The way that we found out what it actually cost to produce that 500 first item is we said, what's the cost to produce 501? And we'll subtract the cost of producing 500. And now it will tell us what it costs to produce that one single item. It's, in fact, 15.01. And we just want to verify that it's really close to 15. You might have to wrap your brain around it when you get to your assignment a little bit. Okay. I just got a couple problems that you guys can add to your previous assignment. Then tomorrow we move on to 3.5. I told you guys that we would do a review of trig, didn't I? Yes, tomorrow we have a review of trigonometry. Four. Okay, uh, so sh uh, problems 8 through 10 are, are examples like objects in the air. I don't have a problem like Boyle's Law because it's almost identical to what we did, so I just want to show you an example like that. The 29 and 30 are the econ type problems about marginal cost. So 18 is... Just no, no. It, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a little bit different. I just, I want. If you don't get 18, that's fine. But at least give it a glance and see if you can work through it. It's not super difficult. It's just some people run into a couple issues. I can teach you how to work them out, but we'll see. Good luck. <laughs>